Father, we thank Thee for the privilege of studying together, and we ask as we consider the teaching of the Word of God that the Holy Spirit may take of the things of Jesus Christ and show them unto us. We pray that Thou would give us an ability to understand the Word and to organize the information that we possess so that we think the thoughts which Thou wouldst have us to think. Enable us to think logically and systematically, above all, under the Spirit's teaching. We commit each one present to Thee and ask Thy blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Tonight is an introductory study, and so the subject for tonight is introduction or the idea, material, and method of systematic theology. Introduction or the idea, material, and method of systematic theology. May I also say this before I begin? I'm very delighted to see a number of you have your notebooks, and you're going to take a few notes. I would like to see those notes, by the way, one of these days, so take good ones. However, I'm not going to conscript them, so keep on bringing your notes, and perhaps you'll be the only one to look at them ever. But for those of you who do not have a notebook, I think it would be good for you to get yourself a notebook and a pen, and note down a few things as we go along. And I will try to give you the outline in the future. I'd like to put it on the board so that you have it there and I can just refer to it, but I'll try to give you the outline, at least the major points, as we go along. But first tonight, as we open our study of systematic theology, just a word or two of introduction. Not long ago, systematic theology was known as the queen of the sciences. I do not know why it was called the queen rather than the king. Perhaps some of the ladies can answer that for me. But at any rate, it was known as the queen of the sciences. But prejudice against doctrine and dogma has changed all of that. We have seen this not only in the cults. Some time ago, I noticed in one of the hymn books of one of the cults that just as I am, that great gospel hymn had a new stanza, and it was this. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, though dogmas I may ne'er believe, nor heights of holiness achieve. O God of love, I come. Now the sentiment of that stanza of just as I am is that it doesn't really make a great deal of difference what we believe. It's just that we come to a God of love and he accepts us. Well, let me assure you of this, that a man may reach God without dogma in one sense. That is, in the sense of some special doctrine that the church may have believed, or a segment of it. But one can never reach God without doctrine. In other words, if you really think that you can come to God, you cannot come to God apart from some teaching about God. And therefore to say, as some have said, that doctrine or dogma used in that sense is unimportant is one of the greatest of errors. And I am quite sure that the originator of that is probably Satan himself. One of the reasons for the distrust of doctrine is the pragmatism of our present day. Men have rejected a revelation from God Therefore, there is no final truth. Everything is relative. All that we have are really working hypotheses. We cannot really know anything absolutely. 
And therefore, dogma is very unpopular. So instead of theology being the queen, relativism has become king. And the queen has been divorced and put away. Well, let's consider first tonight in our study the idea of systematic theology. Now, will you turn with me to our first passage in Romans chapter 6? The idea of systematic theology. Romans chapter 6, and let me read verse 15 through verse 17. Paul says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that whereas ye were the servants of sin, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul refers to the teaching which the Romans had received as a pattern or form of doctrine. In other words, it was a specialized system of truth so far as he was concerned. Now, we, of course, do not have Paul's system of theology. We have letters that he wrote to churches. But in these letters, he refers to the fact that he did set forth and proclaim and teach a certain form of teaching. It is incorrect to say that the apostle did not really care what his converts believed, what his churches heard. He was very interested in that. He spoke about the pattern of truth or the form of teaching which he had committed to them. Now that is not the same as saying systematic theology, but I think it is surely true to say that he taught them definite truth. Now when we think about the idea of systematic theology, I want you to think with me about some specific problems that come before us. And let's begin with a definition. Theology comes from two Greek words. Theos, T-H-E-O-S, which means God. And logos, L-O-G-O-S, which means word, utterance sometimes discourse. It has several other meanings, too. So that theology is discourse about God, or reasoning about God, rational discourse about God. Sometimes we use, theolo we use theology in a very narrow sense, the teaching about God the Father. But generally speaking, theology is used in a very broad sense. It is used about for, to refer to the teaching about God in the fullest sense, theology. And systematic theology, of course, is the systematization of the truth that we learn about God from the Word of God. Hooker, one of the Puritan preachers, defined theology as, theology is the science of things divine. Charles Hodge, one of the great Presbyterian theologians, said, Theology is the exhibition of the facts of Scripture in proper order and relation with principles or general truths involved in the facts themselves which pervade and harmonize the whole. Now you'll notice from that definition that what he's saying is that theology is the facts of Scripture exhibited in a logical and coherent way so that you understand the relationship of these facts of Scripture to one another. On Sunday in our churches and in our Sunday schools and in our Bible classes, we turn to specific passages of the Word of God and we open them up and we expound them. 
Some of the passages are very devotional in content. Some of them are very doctrinal in content. Some of them have both types of teaching within them. In systematic theology, we look at the facts of Scripture, we perceive their meaning, we collect them, we arrange them, we set them in order so that you understand their relationship one to another, and we exhibit them so that systematic theology is the orderly exhibition of the facts of the Word of God and the principles that flow out of a treatment of these facts of the Word of God. It is doctrinal study, of course. That's theology, a definition. Now the aim of theology. Theology's aim is very much like the aim that we have in the natural sciences. In the natural sciences, we have as our aim the perception of the knowledge that we wish, the arrangement of it, the systematizing of it. And so in systematic theology, the same process. We perceive the facts of the Word of God, we arrange them, and then we systematize them. And of course, involved in that is the setting forth of this resultant teaching. So strictly speaking, you study systematic theology as you study biology or physics. You perceive for facts. You collect and arrange the facts. And you arrange them in such a way that you see their relationships one to another. Now the possibility of theology. Is it really possible for us to know theology? Is it really possible for us to have a theology? Well, we of course say it is possible, and we say it's possible for these reasons. Systematic theology grows out of the existence of God. If God did not exist, there could be no theology. But if God exists, so that's a beginning. Then the possibility of theology grows out of the revelation of God. We have talked about this in some of our Bible classes, of course, and we'll talk about it later on when we come to the subject of revelation. But the basic position of the Word of God is this, that God has revealed himself. And if God exists... And if he has revealed himself, uh, then we are a long way toward possessing a systematic theology. God is not a hidden God, according to the Bible. He is a God who has revealed himself. It's rather striking that some of the famous skeptics have at points in their lives acknowledged the fact that there was a God, a God about whom they were very skeptical. David Hume, who was one of the greatest of the skeptics, an outstanding philosopher, was walking one night with Adam Ferguson late in his life, and they were walking out under the stars and the moon, and suddenly he turned to Ferguson and he said, Adam, there is a God. And Hume, the skeptic, acknowledged almost spontaneously what comes by intuition to most men, that there is a God, and that he has revealed himself in some way. And you can see evidence of it in his creation. Even Voltaire, one of the greatest and most noted of the skeptics, is reported to have been in a thunderstorm in the Swiss Alps and suddenly found himself praying. I'm sure he was embarrassed about it afterwards, but nevertheless, he is supposed to have done it. And finally, systematic theology is possible not only because of the existence of God and the revelation of God, but it is possible because of the endowments of man himself. For example, man has been given mental endowments. He has reason. Some of us have reason, at least. Some have more than others. It's not altogether with one sex, either, in spite of what we men might think. 
But men are given mental capacity. They have reason. They have the capacity to judge. They have the capacity to evaluate. They have the capacity to organize. All of these things, by the way, are given by God in order that we might judge and organize and evaluate and systematize the truth about God. Well, he didn't give us this reasoning faculty so that we might learn simply biology or chemistry or physics or insurance or law or medicine. I feel very sure myself that he gave us these faculties primarily that we might know him and understand him and understand him in a systematic way. And from these faculties, of course, we have other realms of knowledge which we may investigate. And he has also given us spiritual capacity. By the teaching of the Holy Spirit, we are able to perceive spiritual truth. So theology is possible because of the existence of God the revelation of God and the endowments of man. The necessity of theology. Uh, will you turn with me to a passage in the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 4. Now I want to read two passages, but I want you to notice in these passages that what we have implied is that there is a body of teaching which is to be committed to men. Now in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul states that God has given gifted men to the church of Jesus Christ. He's given several different kinds of gifted men. He says, verse 11, and he gave some apostles. We know the apostles, there were 12 of them. They went out to found local churches all over the ancient world. And some prophets. Now prophets in the New Testament era were men who had the ability by direct contact with God to take the truth of God and bring it to the churches of God before they had the word of God. Uh, you see, we can come together in a class like this with 66 books the 39 of the Old Testament, the 27 of the New, but the early church did not have the 66 books that we have. As a matter of fact, it is probably doubtful that any one of them had all 39 of the Old Testament. But at least the only thing that they really had was the Old Testament. Then later on, some of them may have had some random writings of the Apostle Paul, or they may have had some of the Gospel accounts, but so far as we know, the New Testament was not collected until much after the Apostolic Age. So the only thing they had was the Old Testament. Therefore, they needed men who would meet with the local church and who were in touch with God to give them the truth that pertained to the New Age, that which we have in the New Testament now. So God gave prophets. And the prophets were given for that very purpose. We don't have any prophets today. I know we often have men say, what we need is a prophet today. They mean by that, they need someone to speak with some authority. Well, of course we need men who speak with authority. Most of all, we need men who will preach the word of God. But we don't have any prophets today. That was a temporary gift given for a special age of the local church when they needed just such a man. We don't need that man today because we have the completed revelation of God in the Bible. That's why prophets are no longer necessary. And some evangelists, men who preach the gospel and build up the church, not only spreading it over the then known world, but specializing in certain areas and preaching the word there. Evangelists. We still have evangelists. Men like Billy Graham, who's best known to us perhaps, and others. And some pastors and teachers, probably those two words should be together, and this is one gift with two aspects, pastor-teacher, that is, the shepherd who teaches. All shepherds should teach. Paul lists the gift of teaching separately in 1 Corinthians 12, so I would presume that some men may teach, but who do not shepherd. But pastor-teachers, now these men are given to the church, why are they given? 
in order to instruct us? Well, yes, but more. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, I don't have time to talk about that verse, but I just want to point this out. But what Paul says is that these men have been given in order to perfect you who are the saints, if you believe in Jesus Christ, perfect you for the work of ministry. In other words, the work of ministry is not done by the minister, as we know. The work of ministry is done by the saints. So when you talk about a man, you say he's a preacher, he's in the ministry. Well, you're not really fully harmonious with the teaching of Paul. Because you see, you're in the ministry too, every one of you. And it is my duty as a teacher, for example, or a pastor teacher, to build you up so that you do the work of the ministry. Paul says in the 13th verse that all of this has a natural aim, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, there is a pattern toward which the church is moving, and Paul calls it the unity of the faith. I would gather from this that the idea of the faith is a body of truth in Paul's mind. And he's looking and working toward the day when the whole church of Jesus Christ reaches its intended aim. And at that time, there will be the unity of the faith. I would take that faith there as the content of systematic theology. So is systematic theology necessary? Of course it's necessary. I think its necessity is found in these things, and let me just quickly state them. First, in the instinct of the human mind for system. Every one of us has within our minds a desire to systematize the knowledge that we possess. One of the beautiful things about expository preaching is that by preaching the text of Scripture, soon a lot of the scriptural doctrines begin to fall into place. And one of the terrible things about topical preaching, that is preaching on this text in this book and this text in the next book and another text in some book in the Old Testament and still another text in another place, and all you get is just texts that are floating around in the breeze, one of the results of that is that the audience that listens to that kind of preaching never really has anything solid and substantial. Have you ever felt that way? I felt that way for a long time. I listened to that type of preaching for 25 years. That is when I listened. It was that type. I never had anything really definite. I had a text over here and a text over there and a text somewhere else and I wasn't really sure they were true to the context when I listened to the text. One of the beauties of expository preaching is that sooner or later it all begins to make a little sense. But it's possible even to be more systematic than that and study systematic theology. Take these truths and systematize them. And I do believe that every one of us has in our mind a natural instinct for order, for system. That is, we like to take what we know and put it together so it makes sense. It is necessary because systematic theology is important for definite and balanced views of the truth. I've been a Christian for a lot of years now. I've noticed this in new Christians and some old ones too. When they get hold of a truth, they're very, very enthusiastic about it. And almost inevitably, they carry it too far. And then they get hold of another truth, and they're very enthusiastic about that. And almost inevitably, they take that truth too far. They're not able to guard that truth by other truths which they have not yet learned. 
And so the result is they don't really have any just view of the biblical truth, and they somewhat misrepresent it very frequently. For example, a Christian becomes a Christian, and of course he's been raised in an atmosphere in which the law was proclaimed. And he becomes a Christian, and he discovers from the study of the Word of God that he's no longer under law. And so, so filled with the joy of the fact that he's no longer under law, he now is on the verge of living as he pleases and becoming what theologians call an antinomian, one who's against law. Now, it's possible for Christians to fall into that trap. Or, on the other hand, it is possible to recognize that there is a definite teaching in the Word of God which regulates Christian conduct and Christian life and to look at it as, as a law and to err that way and to fall in the trap of legalism and seeking to get merit before God and all of the other distasteful things that characterize so much of evangelical Christianity today. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not do the other thing. And all the time, all of these things building up human pride. Now, systematic theology is necessary because it enables us to look at both sides of truths, and I hate to say this because of its implications, but we can arrive at a consensus of what the Word of God teaches on so many of the doctrines. Systematic theology is necessary, too, because of its importance to the Christian life. Christian morality is the fruit that grows from the tree of Christian doctrine. Will you let me say that again, because I think it's important. Christian morality, or Christian life, if you like, is the fruit that grows from the tree of Christian doctrine. In other words, it is doctrine that is responsible for right living. If you have wrong doctrine, wrong living. Right doctrine, right living. Now let's turn to a passage. I wish I had time to support everything I'm saying by scripture, but... If so, we would be just looking up scripture and I wouldn't be able to cover as much ground. You'll have to trust me in some things. If you want to ask questions afterwards, of course, feel free to do it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, Timothy, and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. Then he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. In other words, chief and paramount in Paul's thinking is that the scripture is profitable for teaching. Notice, teaching. Now, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works in other words the good works proceed from the doctrine of the holy scriptures and the holy scriptures are profitable for salvation so you see the order is very plain if you wish to know salvation it is through the teaching of the Word of God, which ultimately brings you to the place where good works come. Christian morality is the fruit that grows from the tree of Christian doctrine. 
That's why it's important that you learn the doctrines of the word of God. That's why for us to say doctrine is not important, devotion is, is to miss the boat. That's not to be very systematic. You see, that's to see something that's important. Your truth must be devotional and to go overboard. This often happens to college students. They are wonderfully converted. And now they have all the joy of the Lord. And somebody comes along and says, you know, doctrine is not very important. The person of Christ is. And just cling to the person of the Lord. This personal relationship, that's the greatest thing in the world. And so he's so thrilled with that, and the idea that he can have a, pers a personal relationship with the Son of God himself, he's so thrilled that he forgets that God gave us the Holy Scriptures, 66 books, to instruct us in the things of our faith. And so he flies off into the ether of devotion to a person whom he doesn't know really a whole lot about because he doesn't know anything about the Scriptures. For this is where you obtain knowledge of him. Now, of course, it's possible to, you know, I heard Dr. Johnson the other night, and boy, did he stress Bible doctrine. From now on, I'm going to apply myself to what the Bible teaches. And so we learn all of the things that the Bible has to say, and we've got all this doctrine arranged in our minds, but very little of it is very practical in our lives. And so we've gone off the other end to the other side, and that, of course, is wrong, too. To be so occupied with doctrine and doctrine and doctrine that there is no reality and vitality of the devotional life in the Christian at all. Systematic theology preserves you from those two errors, of course. But doctrine is supremely important. It's the first thing that we should spend our time learning when we become Christians. And finally, systematic theology is necessary because it is important to the power of the local church. Defective theology leads to defects in the local church. Well, that's not the only source of defects in the local church, of course. But when the local church has not applied itself to discover what God teaches about it, the local church, it's bound to be defective. Some churches are so hamstrung by the doctrine, or lack of it, which they have concerning the local church, that they're unable to carry out God's work. When, for example, the doctrine is such that one man who stands in the pulpit does everything, it's obvious that that church is not going to be a healthy church. It will look healthy if he's healthy. It will look very bad if he's unhealthy. But you see, the New Testament sets forth for us in the Word of God the teaching for the local church. And it has its theology of the local church. And if we do not know the theology of the local church, you can be sure that our local church is going to suffer. One of the saddest things in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ has been the fact that so many churches have gone down the drain having been the recipient of the preaching of outstanding preachers. For example, Joseph Parker was one of the great English preachers. He was the pastor of the great city temple. But unfortunately, Joseph Parker was a textual and topical preacher. He was known all over the country as a great preacher. He has written some interesting books. But when he left, because the people were not grounded in the truths of Holy Scripture systematically, that congregation fell prey to a man who was the leader in the, it was called, New Theology in his day, R.J. Campbell. DeWitt Talmadge had a tremendous ministry in Brooklyn, but his ministry was not expository. As a result, when he left, his church fell into the hands of the Russellites. Imagine that. A man who was an outstanding evangelist, but he preached topical sermons. He did not instruct the congregation in the truths of theology, the truths of Bible doctrine. So when he left, the Russellites moved in and took over. 
You know what might happen in Believer's Chapel? If you don't learn some theology, no telling what might happen. A word about the limitations of theology. Quickly. They are found in, number one, the finiteness of the human mind. By the way, if you hope to discover everything in this class, well, you needn't come back. Because you won't. The human mind is finite, and God could not give us everything. Theology is not only limited by the finiteness of the human mind, it's limited by the blindness of sin. We'll not know everything as long as we're in the flesh. It's limited, too, by the silences of Scripture. Have you ever wished that you had had a hand in the writing of the Bible? I have. Do you know what I would have written? I would have written just a little verse about how our Lord looked. Just a little one. I would have said something about his height, his complexion, his hair, his hands, his feet, a few other things. Unfortunately, we don't know our Lord's appearance. I think I know why now. Because you see, if we had pictured him, or if we knew how he was, we might really wonder if, if we were not like that, if he really was one in whom we could trust. It's very fortunate, I think, that we don't have any such picture of our Lord. In fact, I'm going to get you to turn with me to a passage in the Old Testament which it seems to me is just expresses a general truth that we need to bear in mind when we study theology. Chapter 29, verse 29 of the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, chapter 29 and verse 29. Isn't it nice that it's 29, 29? You can just remember this. And tonight as you're lying in your bed and you're thinking over all the things that have been swimming around in your mind, Deuteronomy 29, 29. That'll put anybody to sleep. Deuteronomy 29, 29. But this is a very important verse. Will you listen to it now? The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. In other words, systematic theology is limited by the limitations or silences, I'm sorry, of Scripture. There are some things that God has not seen fit to reveal to us. He has not revealed to us very much about the life and death of the Virgin Mary. He has said nothing to us about the Lord's appearance. He has not told us a great deal about our state after we die. There are some things I would love to have put in there too, if I could have gotten the information some way. He has not told us about politics. The Bible doesn't really tell us whether we ought to be a conservative or a liberal in politics. Now, many of us have very strong opinions about this, and we think that if you follow the Bible, you must be a conservative. Well, that may be true, but so far as the Bible itself is concerned, it does not say anything like that. It doesn't really tell us what kind of government is preferable. I may startle you, but it really says, so far as I can tell, that democracy is not the best form of government. It really says that ultimately Jesus Christ is going to come and we're going to have a theocracy, which is really the finest form of government, isn't it? 
So there's so many things, you see, that the Bible doesn't really say anything definite about. Now, we may infer from the statements of Scripture, and that's legitimate, but many things it does not really give us definite information about. Theology is limited, then, by the finiteness of the human mind, the silences of Scripture, the blindness of sin. It is also limited by the imperfect state of science itself. You see, when we study systematic theology, we're going to see that we must know a little something about science as well as something about the Bible, for we are seeking truth from all sources. And the truth of God is seen in the revelation of God in nature. But unfortunately, science is in a fluid state, and it always is. I have a very good friend. He's one of America's outstanding scientists. He is a man who has been working with the United States government in the most secret of its operations in the space program for a number of years. He's written 150 very, very scholarly articles. I want to assure you that I could not read the first paragraph of them and understand them. 10, 15, 20 pages of mathematical formulas, that's all they are. Couldn't possibly understand them. He's written now, I suppose, almost 200 articles in the most scientific of our scholarly journals. But this man is a very devoted Christian. He's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I remember asking him a question once. Uh, how do you answer someone who asks you, does the Bible agree with science? He said, Lewis, this is what I always tell them. When they come to me and say, does the Bible agree with science? I always say, what science are you talking about? Science 1880? Science 1890? Science 1900? Science 1920? Science 1950? Science 1960? Science today? He said, science has never been the same. He said, then I say, Lewis, and he said this to me. He said, you know, if the Bible, or turned around, if science ever agreed with the Bible, I would wonder if the Bible was true. Because I know science is going to change. And then he went on to say this, and he's an outstanding scientist. He said, you know, really we don't know enough to question the word of God. He said, most of us who are scientists know, and then I can remember using his hands just like this, he reached up and he said, most of us know out of all the truth that is to be known, most of us know a sliver of the truth. In fact, to tell you the truth, Lewis, I think almost all scientists know just a sliver about that big of all truth. Now he said, I think we know that. I think we really do know this. But he said, we don't know so much else, and we know so little, really, that there isn't a man who is intelligent enough to question the truthfulness of the Word of God scientifically in this way. So I don't think we shall ever fully understand systematic theology while we're in the flesh. Because, you see, we must know not only the Word of God, His revelation in Scripture, but His revelation in nature itself. Science is also limited by, and let me just state these things, and I'll pick this up next time, the incompleteness of our knowledge of Scripture. Our systematic theology is limited that way. It is limited by the inadequacy of human language, perhaps. Paul at times seems to suggest that he just couldn't put words together to say what he knew about the Lord. And systematic theology is also limited by the illumination of the Spirit. In the final analysis, we can only understand what God wishes us to understand. You know, Daniel was given a great revelation of future things, and then after he had all his revelation, do you remember what God told him? Now seal it all up, Daniel, until the latter days. Now we're beginning to understand some of the things that Daniel didn't understand, which he wrote. Systematic theology could not have been completed until then. All right, we'll pick it up from there. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank thee for the privilege of study together. 
We pray that thou will make us diligent in the study of the theology of Holy Scripture. Help us to remember how important it is to listen to the teaching of the Word of God, to systematize its teaching and by the help of the Holy Spirit to carry it out. We commit ourselves to thee now for Jesus' sake. Amen.